that's that's all right. <laughs> Here we are in the Netherlands, not getting our windshield mirror scraped off. Driving in the dirt by tractors and trailers, it's scary as. <laughs> Welcome to Car and Driver. That's the Ferrari Daytona SP3. brag alert the last Ferrari I drove was the Ferrari the La Ferrari and when driving that car the last thing I thought is it needed to be lighter and have less roof but here we are the Daytona SP3 is another highly limited edition from the brand's Icona series which are essentially modern interpretations of historic Ferraris in this case the Daytona SP3 takes its cues from early 60s endurance racers specifically the three that won the 24-hour race in Daytona in 1967. And the design references are everywhere, from the wraparound style windshield to the fender mounted mirrors to the size of the wheel arches. Check out these light covers. Their only function is purely aesthetic. The cover actually moves up and down depending on your light setting. Now, butterfly doors are cool and all, but what's really neat about this is how it channels air. That big opening in just air and slams it back into the coolers, which are mounted right about here, and that evacuates right there. And there's also more air passing through the bottom section. Now, on one hand, it's really neat how they massage air. On the other hand, it makes for a massive door that requires a little bit of work to get in and out. But it's all done for the sake of aerodynamics, and there is a lot to talk about with aerodynamics on this car. You know what's missing back here, and this is a modern hyper supercar, whatever you want to call it, there's no massive wing, and thank Ferrari for that. One of the design intents with, behind this vehicle was no active aerodynamic and apparently no big wing. They wanted to get all their aero work done through the bodywork of the vehicle and underneath the vehicle. And Ferrari says, from an aerodynamic perspective, this has similar aero performance as modern supercars, but they didn't really give us a reference point, but they were very proud of their work, and I think it makes for a much better looking vehicle. One of the most striking design elements of the Daytona SP3 are these horizontal bars on the back of the vehicle. Uh, it's pretty visually arresting when the first time you see it because it's somewhat like uncharacteristic of a modern Ferrari. There's like been previous Ferraris that have this kind of design. But what they're accomplishing here is basically what you have back here is a massive opening for the back of the vehicle. Behind these bars is just vents that allow all the heat to come out from behind the vehicle. What I find most fascinating though is that each of these bars is a unique piece. This is all carbon fiber. None of these are the same width. They all effectively, that means I would assume they have to have their own part number and they're all installed independently. Like some poor guy at the Ferrari workshop has to make sure that these are all installed perfectly level and with the right gaps between them. That's an incredible amount of work, uh, but it looks really cool. And I guess you can do that when you're only making 599 cars, right? The interior of the Daytona SP3 has a lot of modern Ferrari touches. For example, the key fob, of course, has to sit on the center of the tunnel and in this direction so you can always see the prancing horse. Of course, uh, the gauge cluster is digital 
and the bulk of your controls are on the steering wheel. So there's no display in the center of the vehicle, as you can see, Never mind this phone holder. We had to use that uh, to find out our route today. But this screen is where all of your controls are happening. We've also seen that on, like, on the SF90 and other recent Ferrari models. Even the transmission, the shifter, uh, is, looks, is styled to evoke uh, a gated manual shifter from Ferrari's history. So that's all normal Ferrari stuff. What's different about the Daytona SP3 is, of course, these seats. And I say is these seats because it's actually like one seat in one molded piece. The way these seats are constructed is it's just foam attached to the cab or the tub. And I think calling it just foam is probably a disservice. It's a seat that's just bolted to the tub and they're linked over the center here. You can't adjust these. They're just like this. When you order the car, you can choose between three different seat sizes and different sets of recline. But once that's it, that's it. And the way you adjust your driving position, if you're the driver, of course, is to adjust the steering wheel. And the pedals actually move forward and back when you pull this lever. So that's how you adjust your seating position. If you're the passenger, tough. Like, deal with it. You're in an SP3 Daytona. Like, life's good. Enjoy it. How does that translate to the actual driving experience? Well. To me, it seems more of a styling exercise, but it does make for a unique driving position. First, though, let's talk about Ferrari driving dynamics. It's one thing that they seem to exceed at consistently, and there's a couple of factors that play into that. Uh, the ride quality, for example. We're on very smooth roads here in the Netherlands, so we're not really feeling a lot of road imperfections just yet. But overall, this does not feel like a coarse riding car. It's something that's very smooth. The other thing that really plays into the driving dynamics is the steering feel. The steering might be my favorite part about this car. It's that good. Hydraulically assisted, stable on center, a little bit of tingles coming back to tell you road texture and really pleasant feel as you dial in your steering input. It's, it's just delightful. Of course, there's that V12 and uh, it, it is the centerpiece of this car. Above, well in excess of 800 horsepower to the point that like, who's really keeping track? Call it 900, whatever. The sound is everywhere, and that actually, that actually is the aspect that translates most into the historic driving experience, let's say. let's say. It's a very mechanical sounding experience. Yeah, when you get into the higher rev range, it does take on that really nice timbre that you would expect a sweet sounding V12 to make, but there's also a lot of just mechanical noises coming from the engine. That's due in part to engine tuning, of course, but also the way they've assembled this interior. There's a lot of uh, road noise that comes through this interior, and that also allows a lot of mechanical engine noise, too. It's something that makes this car feel like more of an older driving experience from the sound perspective only. When you come off throttle, you can really sense the inertia of the engine helping you decelerate. That's also part of the experience. It's as present on throttle as it is off throttle. Now, other aspects of driving. Uh, we don't have a traditional rear view mirror because, of course, that's all carbon fiber right there. So I've got a video display right here. And uh, so far, it's been okay. I'm someone who kind of gets motion sickness really quickly, and that one hasn't done it yet. So that's good. Uh, overall, the visibility is not bad for what this vehicle is. And this vehicle is severely compromised in many ways for, like, daily comfort, uh, to be blunt, right? This is more of a museum showpiece. This is more of a look at me kind of car than something that you're gonna commute in, obviously. Uh, and for that reason, you know, you have to set your expectations on visibility accordingly. That being said, the mirrors, the rear view mirror in particular, do a pretty decent job of helping you out making, you know, really uh, tight three point turns when you're in a foreign country with people who hopefully aren't too mad at you for making a lot of noise from your Ferrari V12. So that's a good thing. You do get a front axle lift. That's very helpful. I didn't obviously have it on because we were going too quick, uh, but this is a car that is low to the ground. The noise inside this car is ever present. And that's one of those things that, you know, seems to be the intended to tie you into the driving experience because Yes, it allows you to hear more of that mechanical engine noise, but it also makes you hear like a lot of road noise, including debris banging off the fancy carbon fiber bottom of this car. Every time I hear rock, rocks 
hit the bottom of the door sill here. I'm like, oh, because I know that's just carbon fiber and oh boy, I don't want to see that after 10,000 miles. Ferrari won't confirm whether the Daytona SP3 is the last naturally aspirated V12 mid-engine car it will make, so don't think of it as a send-off just yet. As for how it drives, the steering feel and the engine response are simply delightful, but our limited access and the narrow roads we drove on revealed little about how the Daytona SP3 handles or how thrilling it is to drive quickly. While we doubt it will come up short in either department, you can rightfully question whether driving quickly is even the point. Sure, the Daytona interprets a moment of Ferrari's motorsports past through modern design and technology. It looks like a spaceship and draws small crowds when parked, but it also highlights a type of vehicle that exists in fewer and fewer numbers every year. And that's one that reminds you that you're operating a machine. And from that measurement, it's a success.